Good morning, my name is Glenn Davis. I'm a Senior Product Marketing Manager at Treasure Data. Welcome to our webinar, Introduction to Customer Data Platforms. Uh, I just want to make a brief announcement before we get started. Mostly it'll be uh, David speaking, not me, but we've been having a couple of uh, audio issues on our end. So if I am speaking and I get cut off in the middle, have no fear, I will start speaking again in a moment. <laughs> With that, I'd like to introduce uh, David Robb. David, thank you so much for joining us. David is the principal at Robb Associates, uh, a consultancy specializing in marketing, technology, evaluation, and measurement. He coined the term customer data platform in 2013, recognizing this emerging type of software and the term customer data platform was added to Gartner's hype cycle for digital marketing last year. Uh, David is also the founder of the Customer Data Platform Institute where he educates marketers and marketing technologists about how customer data platforms can solve critical marketing data needs. His clients include major firms in retail, communications, financial services, travel, technology, and other industries. And once again, it's my great pleasure to welcome David Robb. Welcome, David. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Glenn. Pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. So I think we will just dive right in to this introduction to customer data platforms. And let's just do a little bit of scene setting, if you want to go to the first slide here which says, what's the problem? Right, why are we even here today? So the problem is something that we will not very cleverly call the data gap. There's the gap between how many people feel a single customer view uh, is important, which is pretty much everyone, 94% in the survey that we did, which, okay, maybe it's a slightly biased sample since it was uh, a lot of people who were members of the Institute. But, uh, no. Even so, every survey we see shows that, that the see. vast, vast majority of marketers feel that, yeah, we need some sort of unified view. And every survey we see also shows that the tiny minority of marketers actually have some sort of a valid single customer view in place, 14% in this. So 94% want it, 14% have it, there's 80% who are somewhere in there. Uh, who do not have it. That's a pretty big gap. Uh, and it's not just our data. If you look at the next slide, there's some data. Uh, this is from eConsultancy, uh, you know, very well regarded and very excellent uh, organization and actually a particularly good study even by their standards. It's one of the better ones that they did last year where they asked a number of questions that were all sort of got to the same point of different things to do with unified customer data, whether it was matching across devices or understanding behavior over time or doing the tailoring by channel or uh, tra linking conversion events with marketing, so doing some attribution or some marketing measurement. In each case, they were all very important to growth, anything between 74 and 84 percent in this particular case. And again, in each case, a tiny minority, 14 to 10 percent actually said that they had a strong capability to do it. So this, this data gap is not just, uh, you know, kind of a figment of our imagination or, or special pleading in any way. This is something that's very real, very commonly recognized. Uh, if you were an audience, I would have you show your, raise your hands if you were sort of in the gap. And I have no doubt that the vast majority of you uh, out there today are, uh, in fact, in this in between state where you know you need it but you don't quite have it yet. So before you get too excited, you always ask yourself, well, okay, why? Why do so few people have this thing when so when so many people say they want it? And one question you ask yourself is, well, do they really want it or not? Are they just kind of saying it because people did take a survey and they sort of give the answers that they think the survey taker wants. Pretty common problem, actually, in survey land. Uh, but, you know, we asked the question, go ahead to the next slide, uh, about what people saw as obstacles to marketing success. Again, marketing success, nothing about, you know, cust you know single customer view success. And uh, lo and behold, single customer view actually came up as the single most important obstacle cited by 58% of the people, I think they could choose up to three, uh, of all the obstacles to marketing and success. And again, okay, slightly uh, biased survey group, but still 
even if it, you, you accept that, remember only 14% of them had it, so even if it's only 58% who think it's important, uh, that's still a pretty big gap here. But in fact, it, it, it's, a, it's you know, the number one issue here, more important than collaboration, more important than budgeting even, uh, more important than training than organizational issues. So at least this group really did feel pretty strongly that having a single customer view was in fact something that was quite uh, a major obstacle uh, to their success and something that they really should solve. So, and again, I think most of you, you might not rate it as your number one, but you probably put it in your top three. Pretty good chance, actually, in most surveys we see that, that getting unified data is actually extremely important and only becoming more important and all sorts of data that, that you've seen about how customers demand you know, these fabulous experiences and they just sort of assume that the company can provide it when sitting on the inside we know how really hard it is to unify our data, let alone provide a unified experience. Wow. So, okay, we're all in favor of single customer view, but let's, let, let's ask ourselves, well, what exactly do we mean when we say single customer view? Because it's actually not such a trivial uh, not such a self-evidently clear term. So let's go to the next slide. And in the same survey, we again actually asked a number of different questions that in one way or another asked whether the, the uh, person answering already had a, a unified customer view uh, in place. And because we asked them slightly different terms, we ended up getting slightly different answers, or actually not so slightly, as you see here. One question asked, basically whether there was any way that they had combined their customer data. Didn't ask how, just, yeah, do you have access to it? And in fact, 72%, most of them said, well, yeah, one way or another, if we want to combine customer data and make it accessible, we can do that. When we asked more specifically if the question asked if there was a central customer database, then we had fewer. I said there were different questions and something between 57 and 33 percent, depending on the question, indicated directly or indirectly that they had some sort of essential database where customer data was assembled. Okay. And then when we asked specifically or explicitly, is it a shared customer database that my different execution systems, like my email system or my web system, actually are reading directly that sharing bit of it only 14% actually had a shared customer database. So there's a big difference depending on what you mean by unified data in, in what people have in place. That 14% is the same 14% that was on that earlier slide about the data gap. So yeah, you know, very few people have a truly shared database. Many more have some sort of kind of access to some sort of kind of unified data. So let's, let, let's go on, and, and next question is, well, why does this matter? So what are you going to do with it? Let's go to the next slide. Here we go. Thank you. Um, and we see the uses, and we ask, you know, what would you do with this single customer view? And most people, the most common answer was personalization. Well, personalization doesn't really require shared access to a central database. It doesn't have to be in that little 14% group, right? I can actually personalize if I kind of take the data and I... I, I just push push the data out and store it locally in all my execution systems. So, so long as I have, you know, a customer status and a name and a few basic things, and I store that over here in my email system, I store it over there in my web system, I store it up here in my call center system, I can do personalization without having a shared central customer database. Customer insight, second most popular use. Again, that... That doesn't require the external systems or the execution systems having access. It just requires that I assemble it in the central database. Remember that middle answer of the uh, 54 to, or 57 to 33% who had a central database because I can do my analytics on the central database without connecting my execution systems to that. So customer insights get relatively a little more, a little less a little harder to do than personalization because I do have to, have to assemble the data, which I don't have to do for personalization, but not as hard as, say, consistent treatments down there at the bottom of loyalty programs uh, or customized service 
where I really do actually have to have my execution systems, my customer facing systems, directly accessing that shared database. So what we see here is that marketers have a pretty nuanced view of what they would do with that single customer view. They understand that some things require tighter integration, require a better, if you will, more sophisticated unified database than other things. Personalization, pretty easy to do from a technical standpoint. Don't need a super uh, fancy unified shared system to do that. On the other hand, consistent, treat consistent treatments definitely need to unify. So marketers are saying that effectively, you know, there's some low-hanging fruit here and uh, most of us wanted to at least do that first. Let's let's do the personalization. Let's do the insights. Let's do the sort of basic things that we can do with uh, our unified data. And then once we get it really great, then we'll get into the fancier stuff like the consistent treatments and the loyalty programs. So those two slides just go together, right? Yeah, more people have a sort of a, a lower level, a simpler kind of sharing uh, and, and they have simpler kind of applications that, that that can be supported by that simpler level of sharing. But as you get into more demanding solutions, the shared database, the consistent treatments that uses the shared database, now you have a much smaller number of people who are doing it. So there's a certain kind of logic to what's going on out there, and it makes sense. People do the easy things first. So let's assume, though, that all of you at the end of the day really want to do the, the, the consistent treatments, the shared database, you know, the ultimate solution, because that's really what your customers are demanding. And again, in most cases, your customers expect. You know, they don't really care if you can say, you know, dear Sally or not. They, they know their name is Sally, assuming their name is Sally. And that, you don't get a lot of points for that. Uh, and on the other hand, if you say, dear Sally, the name is really Sarah, they get really annoyed at you. So it's almost better not to uh, use a name sort of gratuitously like that. But of course, what they really want is they want you to remember that they like these kinds of clothes or that they already own this product and not that product. That's the kind of personalization that really matters, which takes a little more deeper kind of data than just knowing what your first name is. So to, to do that deeper integration, let's go on to the next slide. Let's start talking about what to take to do that, to build that you know, that, that truly shared central database. And here's a very attractive little process flow diagram. I didn't do this slide. Um, but it's a very pretty one. Um, <laughs> that, that, that walks you through that. And let's break the process down into kind of three major steps. So the first step on the next, highlighted on the next slide here, is the, the gathering of data from the source systems. Loading, ingestion, if you want to use those, you know, three syllables instead of two syllables, whatever makes you happy. Um, but how do we get the data from our source systems into some sort of, uh, at least an initial shared data store, maybe it's a data lake, maybe it's just staging tables. Right, Again, different nice names for this sort of thing. So we somehow get that data all together so we can begin to uh, do something useful with it Sorry. or begin to really make it ready to be used. And, you know, even this, even the simplest thing of just getting, you know, getting data from my source systems into my, my initial data store is pretty tricky. You know, I have... Lots of systems I have to connect to. In most cases, most companies have, you know, dozens, sometimes hundreds of systems where customer data uh, resides that they want to get from and load into the central database. Um, those different systems have different kinds of data. It's not all, you know, rows and columns anymore. It's not just your, you know, your standard transaction database. There's text and there's images and there's, comments on social media and there's video and there's a streaming from your internet of thing devices and just all sorts of amazing data that comes in that, that somehow uh, can be relevant. You're not necessarily going to work with all of it from day one, but certainly is data you might need to load or ingest. Once you get your hands on all that data, personally in your data store, they can even physically store it in some useful format. You know, I can't store pictures on my spreadsheet just as a for example, I guess I can actually, but not in a useful way. Um, then I have to do some initial kind of quality checks. You know, is it complete? Did it, uh, does it is, is the data corrupted? Um, you know, is, is it just sort of like fundamentally, 
and the transfer itself happened. And I probably have a little bit of pre-processing that I need to do just to sort of, again, make it sort of useful for my, uh, my, my next set of processes, which are more detailed. And then finally, before we leave this, you know, the other requirement I have, you can think of us as setting requirements for uh, a system selection here, is, is I have a requirement to adjust to changes because I do know that I'm going to have new sources, new data types, new data elements, uh, it just, you know, everything new just happens. Things happen very, very quickly, as, as you know. Um, and so we have to have not only the ability to accommodate what we have today, but the ability to adjust quickly when some new requirement pops up. And get non-trivial set of requirements around that. Okay, so let's go to the next one. And now we've got our data loaded. And now we're going to actually do the fun stuff, which is the processing. And the processing is, is, is really the most tricky part of all this, because this is where we convert that raw data that we've kind of dumped into our data lake into something that's, that's you know, refined and usable. Um, think of an oil refinery. We get our, we just dump in crude oil, we dump, then we get out our gasoline and our lubricants and our kerosene for jet fuel and all the other things that we've sort of extracted and refined from uh, our raw data. So in terms of this one, the processing that we have to go through usually starts with some sort of standardization. So I'm, uh, I get my names and addresses just to choose a simple example in different formats, you know, D-Rob here, David Rob there, um, you, know, you know, Mickey Mouse Rob over here from the person who was being a wise guy. Um, and I have to put all that into something standard and get rid of Mickey Mouse because Mickey Mouse is probably not a real person. Um, then I need to transform it. So, say product information, just as a, for example, I get different product names. I have to put them all associated with the SKU, uh, you know, a consistent product ID so that, so that my data is usable and standardized um, and loaded into the right form for my dates all in the same format, that kind of thing. You know, and, and these are the kind of simple mechanical examples. There's much more complicated things you might want to do. Um, like, for example, uh, read the sentiment on, on a social media comment, the happy, sad, mad, angry, whatever, another kind of uh, transformation that you might, in standardization, you might want to do here. Um, so once I have the data sort of in a useful format, now I have to link identities. And this is probably the trickiest thing of all, which is knowing that this web browser cookie and that device ID and that phone number and this postal address and this account number all refer to the same person. And, you know, that could be a webinar, two or three or four webinars of its own, so I won't go into that in gruesome detail today, but suffice it to say there's lots of different ways to do it. Some are very, very mechanical. Some are uh, very complicated, statistical, probabilistic is the term of art. Uh, things that sort of make a best guess as to, well, these probably are the same person because these two devices, they, they kind of travel around, you know, they, they go on the train together and they're in the coffee shop at the same time and they're at home at the same time, and even though they've never explicitly been linked to the same person, they seem to be sort of moving in the same circle, so they're probably the same person, That's, uh, that kind of thing. So, so some, some very complex processing but I need to do that. I need to link those identities so that I can take my data from my different sources and bring it together into the infamous cu single customer view. That's why it's a single customer view is because we take all the data for the same customer and put it together. Once I've done that, now I've assembled all the data associated with each person, and now I can begin to do some higher-level work on it, things like calculating trends, and aggregations, lifetime time purchases for this person, date of last purchase or time since last purchase, because the date doesn't change, but the time obviously does change. And it's important for me to know, you know, people who purchased 90 days ago or last purchase was more than 90 days ago. Well, I have to recalculate, uh, you know, what was 90 days ago, because obviously it changes every day. So I have all kinds of math that I want to do to, to, uh, to sort of process the data and transform the raw data into something that, that's a little more usable by my different systems, and I usually want to do at least some of that in advance, uh, because doing it on the fly and the con during a real-time interaction when I have you know, 40 nanoseconds to decide whether or not to bid on an ad impression to this cookie, I don't have time to do any kind of fancy math in those 40 nanoseconds, so I really want to do that in advance. And I also want to index at this point, again, just 
it's for access speed once I get the data. And I want to make it so I can get to it really quickly if I'm doing real-time uh, processing, whether it's for ad bidding or website personalization, or even just pumping out emails. And, you know, I might have a second or two. It's not uh, as time-sensitive as web personalization, but it's still don't want it to take very long. So I'll usually have some kind of index to go on to make the data accessible for certain applications, very application dependent. And then finally, let's go to the next one here. We have the last stage of the process, which is the actual distribution or access of, to the data. And again, here we probably, if I'm going to do real-time access for things like uh, bidding or, on uh, display ads or for even web personalization, even call center personalization. Again, a little each of those is a little uh, less demanding time-wise than the previous, but they're all, you know, you still got to be under a second for most of them. Um, I probably have to put it in some format that's really good, really accessible for real-time access. I probably have to summarize it because, again, I can't do too much on the fly calculating. Um, if I'm going to do analytical work, that's a different kind of format because analytical processing deals with different things than one-off processing might, I might use to manage interactions. Um, so then I'm going to create subsets and maybe even push them out into a format that SAS likes or R likes or whatever my system of choice is for, the, for that kind of analytics or, this, or the, 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 uh, some, something that, that works well with, with my, my business intelligence system like my Tableau or my ClickView a star schema, whatever I'm going to use, different formats. So you, I may be storing the same data in many different places, several different places, uh, to, to, for these different kinds of access things. Um, I may need to put it in a database so that I can issue data, so my application can issue database query against it. I may need to structure it in such a way that an API call uh, knows how to find it. So there's lots of different things that I want to do. I may need to publish things like metadata uh, or file structures, again, sort of depending on the technology, to let the external systems even know what's in there. So a fair amount of work involved in making the data accessible, highly, highly dependent on the different applications. In fact, even though those arrows there go in one way, they probably should be double-headed arrows because I'm usually querying back and forth. I'm not just usually pushing the data out to be stored in the applications. So how do we do this? We've looked at the process. We kind of had some sense earlier of what we're trying to get at, which is this shared view of the data so I can use it to personalize and to uh, coordinate my interactions with people. Let's go on to the next question, which is, well, how do I accomplish this? And I actually have several different architectures. If you look on the next slide, we'll see that, um, you know, at least, uh, at least three, right? You know, sort of the, the default situations where I have data silos. We have multiple customer systems, think email, web, uh, call center, uh, mobile app, classic examples, and they don't talk to each other. Natively, they don't talk to each other. They're all separate systems. Each has its own uh, interactions with the customer, so what that little customer system layer is, and each has its own data layer where it stores its own, uh, its own customer data. Those are silos, by definition, not integrated, by definition, not going to allow you to coordinate your customer treatment. Well, the, the simplest way I can connect these guys is by having some sort of a data hub uh, or integration platform, sometimes called, where the data is still stored in the individual systems as you see it there, but the data is kind of shuttled back and forth between the systems. So I get a name on an email, I send a copy of that name to the web personalization system inside the web content management system so it knows the person's name. So when that person shows up, it can show the name. Not storing it centrally, just, just kind of sharing it, moving it back and forth. And I can have process flows to do that. And there's lots of systems that work that way. And uh, there are ways, you know, it has advantages. It's a relatively easy thing to set up. Uh, but, of course, you're storing the data redundantly, and you necessarily don't, all the systems aren't necessarily set up to store all the different kinds of data. So it works pretty well if you have a couple of systems. If you get to, you know, more than a couple of systems, and you really want to have all the data accessible to all the systems, it becomes something of a nightmare. So I'm not too fond of data hubs. 
once you get beyond a pretty simple uh, kind of solution. Or I can build a data warehouse. Now, I do have a central database down that third layer where all my customer data, or a lot of my customer data, is collected in one place. And then the other systems can access that customer data more or less directly. Again, usually they're going to, in fact, have an intermediate storage just for some bits of it. Uh, but at least I have it all assembled in one place so I can do things like trending. If I don't store it centrally, uh, like in the data hub, I can't do trends because I don't store the old data to do trends on. Right? So I, that's, that data warehouse gives me a lot of advantages. Unfortunately, a classic customer data warehouse, enterprise data warehouse, uh, it's really built for analytics. It's not really built for interaction, for real-time interaction management. It's really um, built, uh, updated, on some periodic basis, not in real time, you know, weekly, monthly, traditionally, maybe daily, nightly, now is a little more common, but still not up to the second. Again, my customers want me to be interacting with them, knowing immediately, yes, I just did this, I just spoke to the call center two minutes ago, why doesn't the website reflect that, or vice versa? So I need that kind of real-time update to do it right. And most data warehouses are uh, just not traditionally designed for that, plus data warehouses usually are built by the IT department, which means they take forever to get built, and they're designed as big enterprise, company-wide projects that serve lots of groups other than marketing, which is part of the reason they take so long, and then they often have features that you have to compromise on. So marketing doesn't get all of everything it wants, just gets some of what it wants, because that's how it works when you have a big organization to compromise. Um, the ultimate, or the, over at the far right there, we have a marketing suite. Let's just have one system do everything. Let's use a marketing cloud, and it's in the cloud, so it must be perfect, right? Um, or a suite where one vendor just all the time, you know, my web, my email, my apps, they're all part of the same system. They are all work on one database. Everything is great, and everything would be great uh, if that were real. But if you actually look into the big marketing clouds from people like Adobe and Oracle and, and Salesforce and so on, well, they're really comprised of a bunch of acquisitions, and they look a lot more... Uh, like that data hub model where this, most of the data still resides locally with the individual systems and maybe there's a bit of sharing going on. But it's not usually a truly unified uh, single data. And even if it were, there's going to be one application, some crazy, I don't even know what the latest social media thing is, but, you know, and Pinterest, you know, from a couple of years ago pops up out of nowhere. Now I need a Pinterest interface. Um, and I don't have that. I need a virtual reality interface a little more likely uh, today that not going to be part of my big suite because my big vendor, you know, Adobe, Oracle, sales, sales, guys don't move that quickly. So I'm probably going to have something somewhere that doesn't connect. And now this, this assumption of a single system simply falls apart. So none of those is an ideal solution. Let me say that in some cases they're going to work. I'm not saying that they're useless. I'm not saying they never work. I'm just saying in many cases they're problematic, which, of course, leads us to the next slide, which is a better alternative. Obviously, if we got this far, we're going to have a better alternative, or we would have ended this already, uh, which is the customer data platform, CDP. Um, and my definition of CDP is it's a marketer-controlled system that builds a unified, persistent customer database that's accessible to external systems. So that's a very carefully crafted definition, marketer controlled, which, for example, your enterprise data warehouse is not. Uh, unified, which your hub, your data hub is not. Persistent, which your data hub also is not because it doesn't store anything. Customer data, it means it's organized around customers. Um, and then accessible to external systems, which again, a lot of the, a lot of the, the, um, a lot of the suites are really you know, only accessible to the other products within the suite. So that's how they're designed, and they have, there's usually some access from external, but it's not uh, necessarily the access that you'd really want. So, you know, the CDP, is, it's a very specific thing. Probably the most important of all these things is the marketers are in control of it. You, know, you can get it. It's really designed for you as a marketer. It meets marketing needs. We just don't worry about the other folks, not that they're unimportant. They're just... Let them build their own system. We really need to get something that meets marketing's need because this is so important to the company as a whole that we simply can't work with a system that doesn't meet marketing's true needs and they can't adjust very quickly as those needs change because those needs do change all the time. All right, moving ahead. Um, 
other things, you know, that's the definition. Most CDPs, not all, it's not part of the definition, but most of them have a cloud deployment. Most of them are software as a service, so you don't have to buy the software uh, and perpetual license and load it into your on-premise system. Although sometimes you do, many vendors offer both options in some industries like, you know, banking and stuff, uh, or increasingly perhaps over in Europe, we have some privacy issues. You actually, you do want to load it and run it in-house, run it on your own servers. Uh, so that's an option, but most of these vendors, software as a service is the way to go. They're using NoSQL data stores, which is a very blankety term, at least the way I'm using it. But again, because they're dealing with things other than very structured rows and columns and tables and stuff in a traditional relational database, uh, they use other data stores that are better suited to that. Um, they are doing uh, real-time access. As we said, there are applications often that require real-time access. Again, not all of them do, but many of them do. Um, and they often have supplemental applications, things like campaign management or predictive modeling or, uh, or good journey orchestration. There's a bunch of things that a lot of these systems built in, um, often because it makes it easier, frankly, for them to, uh, to be purchased by a marketer. It's just, well, a database is nice, but I really have a specific headache I have to solve. I really have to you know, personalize my website. Well, I have a little website personalization app kind of built into the CDP. It makes it easier to buy the CDP and get to get immediate value from the CDP. So a lot of the CDP vendors, not all of them, uh, do have that. Whether you need that really depends on what else you have because if you already have a great, you know, predictive modeling system and a great web personalization system, you just need the CDP to provide you with the data. If you don't have it, it's nice to have. So those are the kinds of things that we see people looking for. Um, and but let me make clear that, ne next slide here, you know, it doesn't solve everything. You see, it, it's not a, not so bullet, not a cure-all. Um, so what were some of the obstacles, again, in the survey that we asked? Budget, problems extracting data from my current system, which are limits of my current system, not problems with my CDP, organizational issues, priorities, a whole bunch of things. You know, technology is really right down there at the bottom of the list. You know, getting your hands on the technology to do this stuff uh, is kind of the easy part. You know, getting the budget, getting your, having other systems that can work with it, either, you know, extracting or, or, or you know, systems can't use for it from the bottom there. You know, I have to have the other stuff in place to make, to make use of the, of, of the CDP technology. So, you know, CDP... It's a building block. It gives you a tool. Uh, you know, if you don't have the lumber and the nails and the blueprints, and having a hammer doesn't really do that a lot of good. So CDP is a great hammer. If you have everything else, it's fantastic. If you don't have everything else, then you just kind of stand there with a hammer, uh, probably hit yourself on the head. <laughs> on the other hand, let's go ahead to the next one. Let me be clear that, you know, no, it's not a silver bullet, but nor is it snake oil. You know, this stuff exists. There's at least two dozen vendors in, who meet my definition of CDP that I just provided with you, and there's other vendors who use the term, and other vendors who do, you know, build unified databases that are not CDPs. But just in the CDP space alone, um, and actually this particular slide, these numbers are evolving. It depends on who you count and what you count. Probably about 15,000 installations among the various vendors, although a lot of those are maybe not true CDPs. Um, but certainly several thousand serious, you know, enterprise CDP type implementations. Uh, industry probably has around 300, maybe 350 million in revenue, at least 700 million dollars in funding uh, so far to date in the industry. So it's, it's a pretty, you know, decent sized little industry. It's not huge. Probably doubling every year. Most of the bigger vendors at least growing 50 percent. Many of them doubling, even tripling. You know, smaller guys grow faster, of course. So it'll, it'll, it'll. It'll hit a billion uh, within three years or so easily. So, you know, it's a real thing, not snake oil. It really does exist is the only point of this slide. Uh, and last but not least, let's just go to the final slide and let's summarize it. So these are the key things, you know, I want you to remember, right? You know, the data gap is real. You know, it's not just that people say they want it. They really do see a need for these things. The really, the best way to meet the real goals is with the unified shared database with direct access to it. 
Okay, so there's other solutions like just sharing data back and forth, and they are having an analytical database that, that can't be accessed externally. They provide they meet some of the goals, but if you really want to give that that consistent customer treatment, you really have to have a proper CDP. The conventional solutions, as we say, don't do that. So the CDP really is a better alternative. It's a proven alternative approach that that in many cases. Uh, will really meet these goals probably better than anything else. So with that, let me turn it back over to Treasure Data to talk a little bit more about specifically what they do with their solution. David, thank you so much. It's really great to kind of get a full picture of the customer data platform the needs that it was developed to solve. As David talked about, having a unified customer view is one of the greatest unmet needs that prevents companies from accomplishing many of their marketing goals. And uh, Treasure Data is a customer data platform, and it is also um, a live data management platform, and I'll get into a little bit more about what that means. But it was really designed to to solve this problem of, uh, of achieving a unified customer view. One of the things that we looked at in developing Treasure Data is companies that do this, companies that, that achieve a unified customer view, outcompete all of the other companies. They are the companies that are really uh, outdistancing their competitors in the digital economy. Mark Andreessen said that software is eating the world. We really say that data is eating the world because what differentiates these companies is how they use data. Everybody knows this, right? And as companies rise to the challenge of competing in the digital economy, they naturally adopt SaaS tools to solve various problems. Um, and a lot of the, these tools are really, really fantastic. They do what they do very well. But uh, they tend to, there tends to be a problem, which is that they're not exactly designed to share data freely between each other and to make it really easy to centralize the data, to unify it, to achieve uh, a single customer viewpoint. And so there's a tendency, as anybody knows who's tried to connect them, for SaaS tools to become siloed point solutions. This results in fragmented data and dependency of marketing teams on engineering. And Treasure Data was designed to meet this challenge that results from siloed data where data is disconnected, um, it is fragmented, it's delayed, it's hard to get the data when you need it, when you're dependent on engineering to, uh, to make changes especially, and it's not accessible to the people in the organization who need it. This leads us to the definition of what I said earlier, which is live data. So by live data, we don't simply mean like real-time fast data, although that's very, very important. We also mean data that is connected. The most valuable insights come from connecting data across multiple sources, as David talked about. We're talking about data that's current, that you can access the data that you need today. and that it's easily accessible both to the other departments that may need to access that data, but as, as David talked about, to the other systems that need to work with that data. Most marketing departments are using lots of different tools and they need to be able to connect those tools to whatever central system that they're using. And that's why Treasure Data was created. Here is a just a quick, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but a, a quick overview of the architecture of, uh, of Treasure Data. And it's designed to be able to take in data from any common data source. Um, we have over 100 off-the-shelf connectors in order to easily port the data into the system, which then unifies the data and automatically behind the scenes unifies the data so that it's all accessible in one central place, it gives you power tools to analyze the data and then activate the data by sending the data out to all the different systems that need to use it. So, you know, we wanted to make it possible for companies to outsource live data management so that they can compete with the data giants without the need to hire armies of of uh, data engineers to do so and the the so the platform is really built from the ground up to achieve this purpose there's no uh, no place in the platform uh, where you're going to have a break in that 
uh, ability to have your data be connected, current, and easily accessible. And um, we have a roster of amazing customers, uh, including Warner Brothers, Subaru, Pioneer, and Toyota. I just wanted to zoom in really quickly on one case study that shows the power of uh, live data management as it is applied to customer data platform, and that is um, Shiseido. Uh, Shiseido is the fourth largest cosmetics company in the world. Uh, in 2012, they formed a, a new website, Watashi Plus, which enabled customers to receive expert health and beauty advice and product recommendations. And with this website, Shiseido really had a vision of developing a personal relationship with their customers that would, and, and to really be able to deliver a very, very high level of service across all of their channels. Um, but there were some obstacles to, to doing this. And really, the, that, those obstacles boiled down to the difficulty of achieving a single customer view. And Shiseido was not lacking for data, I should make clear. They had lots and lots of data from various sources. The, the trouble was putting it together into a single customer view. So um, this is kind of an overview, again, of the, of, of how, of the solution that we built uh, for Shiseido. With this solution, Shiseido was able to actually co combine that first party data, like uh, the, the first party data that they would collect from people visiting the Watashi Plus platform, combine it together with all of the other data that they were gathering, including offline data, uh, customer surveys, user demographics, and then bring that data all together and then enrich it by pulling in data from second and third party uh, data management platforms. So that gave them richer information about each customer, uh, statistics, income, data exchange, point of sale data, a very, very deep cut at exactly who that customer is. This enabled them to do smarter advertising, more personalized communication, and then they could take all of this data and pipe it into their uh, data science and business intelligence so that they could uh, do even more advanced uh, analysis of it. And this had a dramatic effect. There was a, an increase in customer lifetime value of, uh, of customers who participated in the loyalty program. Uh, Kenji Yoshimoto, who is the lead direct marketing analyst at Shiseido, said this, uh, blasting emails to everyone who tried samples or bought a particular product won't lead to customer delight. Detecting a mood swing in a customer and changing the tone of push notifications does. So this made them exquisitely, this solution Solution made them exquisitely sen sensitive to the moment-by-moment -moment needs of their customer, and they were able to kind of move from marketing automation to customer preference management. So, um, so that's Shiseido. And with that, I'd like to stop so that I can give our attendees a chance to ask some questions, and I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Laura. Uh, yeah, we had a question. Um, so what do customer data platforms cost? Like, what's the price range? Um, and what do you need to, what skills do you need to have in order to uh, have one, deploy it, maintain it? Um, you know, how do we, how do we make it work? And uh, David, you want to address that? Uh, certainly. Um, and, and of course, you know, it depends. I am a consultant, right? So I'm obligated by union rule most to start every sentence with it, every paragraph with it depends. Um, you know, some of the CDP systems might be as low in the enterprise world, you know, 100 grand, maybe fewer, even less than 100 grand per year, um, more commonly, two, three hundred thousand dollars a year for an enterprise deployment. Uh, if you're a small company, you may get away with less. The pricing varies greatly by vendor. So some of them are down it. There are a couple actually companies that are sort of specializing in just, just beginning to see a few who are specializing in CDPs for small businesses, which is kind of mind-boggling. Most of these still are enterprise platforms. Remember I said earlier maybe 15,000 deployments. Uh, two or 3,000 of those 15,000 deployments uh, are sort of enterprise big deployments that are the kind I'm talking about here. The rest of them are things uh, that are in fact considerably smaller. So you, you have you have a, a fair uh, variety. Have I danced enough around that question? But it is a significant investment. All right, it, it, it is, is the bottom line. These things are not you know cheap. This is not buying spreadsheet software. In terms of the resources needed, again, it depends. But you know, at the minimum. Uh, you're you're going to have to have some help from your IT department connecting to your systems. Now, if you're really lucky, your systems are kind of standard 
often cloud-based marketing systems where there are APIs and it's not really that big a deal at all to connect with them. Um, usually the more technical work of the deployment is done by the CDP vendor. They have professional services teams or partners who will do that. So it doesn't require a great deal of technical work either from the marketing people or from the IT department within the buying company. Um, if you're in a more complicated environment, if you're going to start adding new sources, you know, then you begin to get into some technical needs. But more than anything else, you would need marketers who know what they're trying to accomplish so they can specify the use cases and make sure that they uh, do the initial deployment to capture the right data sources and make them connected to the right systems so they can get some value out of the system and then grow, or grow after that. That's great. Yeah, and I'll just say from a, 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 as far as treasure data goes, um, that uh, really, as David said, it's hard to answer that question without knowing the the particular individual needs of the customer. Um, I I would say you know if uh, if you're interested in treasure data, please you know contact us. Take a look at treasuredata.com. Um, the it, we we charge based on usage, um, which means that we charge based on the amount of data that's being collected and the, then the, the uh, compute resources that are that are going to be necessary, and that's on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and um, it's going to make a very, very different, big difference, like on uh, what scale we're, we're talking about. Um, I have a question here from Joseph. Um, who wants to know, uh, so right now IT is very much in charge of all their data, and so how... Um, are there best ways to convince the IT department to uh, like l let marketing have a CDP? How how would you convince the people who need to be convinced? <laughs> well, screening of Exodus might be a good place to start. <laughs> but you know, let let my data go, that sort of thing. <laughs> if you if that doesn't work. Um, you know, IT departments are really find they're very proprietary about their data. It was just a survey I was looking at the other day where they asked IT departments what their priorities were, and like marketing was literally number twenty out of twenty-eight. Uh, was not at the top of their list. The top of their list was security and reliability, like numbers one and two uh, by far. You know, so they really see themselves correctly as the stewards and the protectors of company data. So they really worry about that. So you have to convince them that, well, first of all, these things exist, they're real, you know, big companies are trusting them, it's a proven, safe solution, safety is super important to many IT departments, mm -hmm. so, you know, it's not a fly-by-night thing, um, and, and, you know, the CDP vendors, they deal with data from a lot of companies that have really vetted them very thoroughly, and you know, your IT department should be willing to do that as well, but you can, they should be pretty confident going in that, that, that it's, uh, you know, safe kind of thing to do, so that's part of the objection you have to overcome. The other big objection, you know, often is IT department says, I can do that myself. You know, I'm, I, first of all, I've been looking, for, dying for an excuse to build an enterprise data warehouse, and here it is, or I already have an enterprise data warehouse, and why can't you use it? Um, or, you know, oh, golly, if you really need it, I'll build you one. Um, so you just have to show them the urgency of your need. And say, well, you know, you, you know, guys, that's really great, but you have so many all the really important things to do that I hate to get in your way. Here we have this little solution, and, you know, even if it's not, you know, really, really cheap, it's still probably going to cost less than, than having, you know, a team of eight people working for three years, which is what will take you to do it. You can't say that, of course, but you can sort of give them some sense of that this is a pretty big project, and this is really a way that, that, that they can avoid doing work which they could actually are using resources that, that they have a better uses for, basically. This is an easy problem to solve. Why don't you take your, you know, your wonderful IT resources and apply them to the problems that are more unique to our company than this one? So some argument along those lines that, you know, really there are better ways that, that IT can spend its time uh, sh should help uh, that along, you know, quite a bit. And be very specific about the use cases. I want to do this, this, and this. Because can I build a database if I'm an IT guy? Yeah, of course I can build a database. That's what I do. I love building databases. I build them all the time. Can you build a database that will serve, support this very specific requirement? That's when things get a little ugly and they begin to sort of like think about it. And, you know, they, they come back overnight and they say, well, you know, come to think of that. This is really a major pain in the neck. And if you have a better way to do it or if you have another way to do it that doesn't require a big team on my part, 
you know, I'm open to that. Uh, quickly. Yeah. Um, okay. I uh, got another question here um, from Eric. Are there uh, other examples besides um, Shiseido that we could talk about um, of where a customer data platform was made a big difference or was useful? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that um, Shiseido is an interesting example because they they combine uh, you know online and offline. They're a big retail giant. We have another example uh, that is somewhat similar to that um, with Muji. Um, Muji is the uh, is the Walmart of Japan. They they're they they're a huge brick and mortar store, and they wanted to um, to unite unify the online and the offline experience so that they could use data from the from customers uh, offline shopping behavior and connect that together with their online behavior to incentivize the users with loyalty programs coupons to go into the store and, uh, and they were able to you know talked a little bit earlier about what kind of skills do you need and you know what resources do you need to implement a customer data platform Muji is a really interesting case because they uh, the the department that had to implement this was one guy <laughs> for this giant uh, enterprise so uh, to us that's we're very proud of that that's a testament to um, you know to, to really how much power we think treasure data gives you because it makes it possible for people who who, who are strapped for resources, for a marketing department strapped for resources, to actually manage this very, very powerful, complex um, solution. Another quick example that I would uh, point to, uh, an e-commerce uh, example, is Wish. Um, Wish is a is a shopping mall in your pocket. Their vision basically was to make it make their app so that uh, so that it learns from your shopping uh, behavior and um, and it knows what you want to see so that when you go into the app it's it's fully it's a complete browsing experience so you see uh, products that are based on your preferences and that and that experience improves over time and uh, you know wish has just taken off like a rocket they they uh, they had a three billion dollar uh, valuation um, and uh, and I think that's really built on top of it's a it's a company that is really uh, clearly built on top of robust data infrastructure and again having a ha having unified customer view and if you look at interviews with uh, with our customer over at Wish they'll talk about this how the how how really they see this the, the problem of building a recommendation engine as a data infrastructure problem more than anything else and Treasure Data enables that so that's a couple of examples off the top of my head. David, do you want to uh, chime in with the, anything there? Uh, yeah, there are actually lots of examples that, that we come across. And, you know, of course, I've talked to many different vendors. Um, and, and, and what's useful is to have very specific ones, so like, you know, identifying behavior changes uh, so you can find out who's a churn risk or a sales opportunity. Um, Optimizing your your search bidding uh, based on lifetime value of the customers because you have that accessible. Um, building personas based on data with uh, third party enrichment, which is kind of one of the examples that we just saw here. Um, creating a golden record of, of, of the best information about a customer by combining data from multiple sources. Lots of very specific things that people do with CDPs and and. You know, obviously, every company has to figure out which are sort of the pain points that they're most eager to address. You know, the nice thing about the CDP, of course, is it, you know, it's a little bit of snake oil in the sense that it does cure almost everything, but you have to um, still decide what it is you want to cure first and, and then tailor your business case and tailor your planning and tailor your deployment plan, uh, you know, to solving those problems. But it's there's a lot of... Nobody has ever told me that they ran out of things that they could do with their CDP. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, if anybody has any questions, you can speak up. Um, but I have a question, because David, you mentioned this. Is there a song about customer data platforms? <laughs> what is there? <laughs> there? There just so happens to be one. Um, oh, my gosh. Which I guess, if we were really clever, we could even go out to YouTube and play it right now. I don't know if you guys are 
have that technical capability in the WebEx, but... <laughs> I think we might have to do that in post. Yeah, David. we'll do it in post. We'll send it, <laughs> we'll send it out in our thank you email. If, if you go to YouTube and you just search for Customer Data Platform Blues, you will find the Customer Data Platform Blues, a heartfelt <laughs> folk tune that, that was allegedly recorded uh, by the WPA in the 1930s, although I find that a little hard to believe. <laughs> That's at least the way it's presented there, and uh, it's a very sad song. Oh, no. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, it, but it has a happy ending because this customer data platform <laughs> solves all these problems. So by all means, go ahead and listen. Well, that is fantastic. I'm sure all of our uh, attendees are out there Googling that at this, yeah, at this moment. Sad,